Hello, welcome to the Slash CNC Runtime with Gibbs Cam High Speed Machining Strategies webinar. We are very happy that you could join us today. During the webinar, if you have any questions, you can enter them into the chat. There are several Gibbs Cam experts monitoring the chat to answer your questions. And finally, this webinar is being recorded and you'll receive an email with a link to the recording tomorrow, just in case you'd like to review it or share it with a colleague. What you're seeing on my screen is video I shot last week at a local tech school where the regional Haas distributor graciously gave me access to a VF2 super speed so that I could shoot this video. I ran a total of five parts using volume mill for the high speed roughing and current tooling and strategies for finishing the walls, the floors, and the 3D surfaces in that order, by the way. So what is high speed machining? For today's purposes, I'll define high-speed machining as utilizing machining strategies that take advantage of modern tooling, modern machines, and modern toolpath strategies to improve productivity and lower part, tooling, and machine costs. Especially since 1984, there's been tremendous development in tooling in the form of better material grades, better coatings, and better, often specialized, geometries. During that same period on the machine side, although some industries and certainly some parts still require them, we've largely moved away from a focus on heavy, high horsepower machines capable of hogging out material really by sheer force to faster machines with faster spindles, smarter controllers, and more memory. On the programming side, Gibbs Cam offers toolpaths specifically designed to take advantage of current tooling and current machine capabilities to significantly reduce cycle times, while at the same time often improving tool life and reducing cutting pressures, thereby reducing wear and tear on your machines. These high-speed machining strategies, both for milling and turning, can provide really eye-opening benefits to your shop. Today, we'll explore these toolpath strategies, how and where they can be best applied, and the benefits that your shop could reap from applying them going forward. Let's start out by taking a look at our part. This is the same part from the video you just saw running a moment ago. My initial take on this part would be that we've got some relatively tight areas we'll need to get into. Uh, especially back in this corner and up in here and through here. In reality, it's unlikely that any of our roughing choices will be able to adequately rough these areas with a single tool uh, unless we chose to rough with a small, uh, maybe a quarter inch end mill. So one often overlooked component of high speed machining is knowledge of material remaining. How well does the software understand exactly what has been removed previously and how well can it exploit that information to eliminate air cutting with the smaller follow-up roughing cutters? Gibbs Cam does this extremely well. Although this part is largely comprised of straight walls and flat floors, it also has the tight areas we just addressed and some relatively small 3D features uh, which are at different levels to deal with. As we look at various ways we could approach roughing this part, we will address cycle times, of course, but we'll also look at how well these different approaches account for our need to finish these areas. Let's create a somewhat typical traditional pocketing or roughing toolpath to give us an approximate baseline for comparison. We'll program it the way that many, many shops uh, would rough this part out today. I'll deactivate this operation and activate this one and clear the process list. For this toolpath, I'm going to use a mid-range 3 quarter inch 4 flute carbide end mill and perform a roughing operation. We'll do a basic offset rough. We'll use the speeds and feeds recommended by the manufacturer of the cutting tool. 
and apply those and a cut width of half the end mill diameter. I uh, don't really need a lead in or lead out for this cut. Uh, don't want to leave any 2D stock. I'll use surface stock instead so that it leaves it as equally as possible on all surfaces. I do want to make sure that use stock is checked so that the tool path works from the full stock body rather than the outline of the part. Let's see, my clearance values and my starting depth look good. And I'm going to pull our final depth from the model by using the Alt key and clicking on the outside wall to get the depth at the bottom of the part. And let's see, I'll go past that by another 20 thousandths. And we'll make our step downs half the end mill diameter, 3 eighths of an inch. Uh, we can create a pass for each flat. Uh, it would actually probably be quicker to hit the flats after each pass, but uh, this strategy seems to be more common. The rest of these should be fine for this cut. And I'll go to the Solids tab, and I'm using the Global Roughing Tolerance, which is currently set to 1 thousandths. And I'll leave 20 thousandths surface stock, meaning the tool will stay a minimum of 20 thousandths away from each face. The rest of these settings should be fine. Uh, let's select this operation, and we'll replace it with our new tool path. And let's see what that looks like running. As programmed, this roughing operation takes well over an hour, and it really fails to give us much detail on the finer features of the part. We will use this as our initial baseline as we walk through some of the more current strategies that GibbsCam provides. All right, I'll deactivate this one and activate this one. And let's take a look at plunge roughing. I sometimes hear feedback that plunge roughing is the fastest way to remove material, and there's certainly an element of truth in that statement. Plunge roughing does align the primary forces of the cut along the axis of the tool, the axis of the spindle, and the axis of the spindle bearings. As far as making the cut utilize the kinematics of the machine for maximum rigidity and ability to withstand cutting pressure, plunge roughing is really hard to beat. So, the advent of plunge roughing, especially as appropriate flat-bottomed carbide insert drills became widely available, did certainly move the needle of productivity in heavy roughing significantly. Material removal rates were better, and in some situations, but not all, chip evacuation was much less of a problem. Gibbscam offers automatic creation of plunge roughing patterns, and for some relatively prismatic parts, especially in deeper features with straight walls and flat floors, or 3D features uh, on the floor, but relatively deep uh, features uh, that are simple, relatively simple, plunge roughing might be the best way to accomplish the task. But when we look at this type of 3D part, parts with a lot of detail at different levels, plunge roughing usually produces a part that has to have at least one, if not two or more, additional operations to prepare it for finishing. As you can see, although this operation takes less than 18 minutes to rough, actually, sorry, less than 19 minutes to rough, it doesn't really get us very close to finished shape, especially in the 3D areas of the part. With this large stair-step finish, this part still has far too much material in places to be ready for finishing. So let's open the dialog and adjust some settings. We have a drop-down that gives us options for what type of pattern we're creating. Linear, circular, using guide curves, or following a contour. And we can define the part as a core, which would typically be either higher in the middle than the outside or an open pocket, or we can define it as a cavity. Since we're in linear mode, forward step defines the distance from one plunge to the next along a single line or row of consecutive plunges. Side step defines the distance between adjacent lines or rows. We have tolerance and stock settings, and we have the depth for clearance uh, as it moves between plunges, and the linear cutting angle, which controls the angle of the rows of plunges. Zero degrees will cut in the x-axis starting at the front, 
180 degrees will cut along the x-axis starting at the back. 90 degrees cuts in the y-axis starting on the right and so forth. And then here we have the ability to define a wall pull off so that the tool pulls away from the wall it just created slightly so that the tool doesn't wrap it back out still in contact with the vertical wall. Let's create a finer step over. We'll take the forward step down to a sixteenth and the side step down to three sixteenths. This is about a third each way, a little less on one and a little more on the other which means we just increase the number of plunges to somewhere around nine times what we originally had. I'll activate this one and we'll replace it with the new tool path. And let's see what that looks like. Well, creating smaller step overs definitely reduces the stair steps, but they're still significant and our material removal rate quickly drops when we reduce the step overs. This operation plunge roughs with finer forward and side step over settings and although it gets significantly closer to the finished shape, it would still need some more roughing and a semi-finishing pass at the very least prior to finishing. And the cycle time has jumped to over two hours, more than even the traditional methods. So plunge roughing can be effective on part shapes where you can take advantage of the larger forward and side step settings as long as it still produces a rough part that's close enough to finish shape to not require excessive additional work prior to finishing. But it's not always the best way to rough more complex parts, especially those with several levels and with finer details or smaller details. All right, let's take a look at high feed mill. Uh, as machine tool builders continued to improve spindle speeds and use faster processors and increased memory capacities, tooling manufacturers continued improving their material grades, their coatings, and their geometries, creating more specialized tools. One interesting development was the high feed mill, also called a convex tip cutter. Due to the geometry of the tip, this tool is capable of very high feed per tooth feed rates while maintaining a better surface finish than the feed per tooth would imply. This is a similar effect to some of the high performance turning strategies. The high feed mill typically takes a very small axial depth of cut while using nearly the full width of the cutter at very high feed rates compared to RPM, often 20 thousandths or more per tooth. On this part, I'm using a normal Gibbs Cam 2D roughing process. Let's, let's go ahead and take a look at how I have it set up. This is a Gibbs roughing routine using an offset with cleanup strategy. Our spindle speed and feed rate are based on the recommended surface speed and chip for the material from the tooling manufacturer. The feed rate is 20 thousandths per tooth or 60 thousandths per revolution. We have a significant cut width, nearly the full diameter at the tip of the tool, and we can do this without leaving uh, nubs uncut in the corners because we're using offset with cleanup. I'm not leaving any 2D stock. Since my tool path is based on a solid model, I'll use surface stock instead. Let's see, uh, I do want to check the use stock option so that the tool path engine considers the stock. With these recessed areas in the model, if I don't select use stock, these areas may not be cut. The other thing I want to point out on this page is the step down. Again, this is directly from the tooling manufacturer. Uh, I think they showed 20 to 30 thousandths axial depth of cut, and I just decided to hit the middle of that range. Oh, and I have it hitting the flats after each pass. This strategy is faster than adding passes and still leaves more uniform material remaining than not hitting the, hitting the flats at all. On the solids tab, I am using my global roughing tolerance, which is set to one thousandths, and I'm leaving a minimum of 20 thousandths on all surfaces. I have part body and slice offset body selected, but really this is pretty clearly a 3D body, so I expect the 3D engine to be used for this toolpath. Now let's take another look at this toolpath running. 
On this part, roughing with a high feed mill using standard Gibbs roughing routine, using offset with cleanup to allow stepping over nearly the full effective diameter of the tool, gives us a tremendous improvement in cycle time at just over 21 minutes. It also produces a part that is very close to finished shape on the 3D areas, but due to the diameter of the tool, it fails to rough the tight places. Although with the cycle time improvement, coming back and doing some material only machining would leave us with a good overall cycle time for this method. One place where I found high feed mills to be particularly superior to any other strategy I'm aware of is deep slot type shapes. I worked with a company several years ago that made a huge number of parts with a particular style of slot through nearly four inches of 4140. When I first went there, they were machining them in a traditional style, a uh, carbide end mill taking step downs of half the, uh, half the cutter diameter and just pocketing out what they could. And then when they exceeded the reach of the end mill they started with, they switched to a longer end mill uh, and continue on. Well, we first tried volume mill, but due to the depth compared to the possible end mill diameter, this also required changing to a long end mill. And once we changed to the long end mill, volume mill was a little less effective. Although the strategy was a huge improvement over what they'd been doing previously. After a conversation with my tooling rep, we tried a three quarter inch high feed mill. Since no point of the cross section of the pocket or slot was greater than an inch and a half, we were able to Z-ramp contour these slots in less than six minutes each, down from well over 20 minutes originally. This works because high feed mills are designed to cut at fairly high surface speeds and a very high feed rate and are extremely rigid for their diameter. This can be a very effective strategy in the right situation and is a great strategy to keep in mind. All right, I saved it for last in our discussion on milling, but volume mill is absolutely my go-to tool path for many roughing tasks on the mill. It's a powerful and effective tool path engine. The strategy with volume mill is to take a deep axial depth of cut, ideally twice the diameter of the end mill, regardless of whether you're cutting aluminum, tool steel, or titanium, and a shallow radial depth of cut in a high-level modified trochoidal tool path that ensures the tool never engages more than the step over you specify. There is never a corner or a channel or a slot where the tool is cutting more than you planned, so you don't have to account for heavy loading in these areas with your speeds and feeds. This strategy takes full advantage of chip thinning and allows much higher surface speeds and very high feed rates. I want to emphasize that this tool path will most likely increase the life of your tooling, often uh, by several times. I, I sometimes watch videos online of high speed machining and I'm interested in the comments that are, let's just say, skeptical, often referring to the tool paths as end mill destroyers or cutter burners. And sometimes those descriptions are correct. And often these videos are shown cutting aluminum. Volume mill does great on aluminum, but I can machine aluminum pretty darn fast even with normal tool path. That's why the video you saw at the beginning of this is cutting 4140, not aluminum. I cut five of those parts and it would be difficult to tell any of the end mills used on those parts from brand new ones. Since volume mill is tested with end mills from helical solutions, and that happened to be what I was using for this part, I was very comfortable using the numbers recommended by volume mills technology expert. But really, I've used those numbers successfully using many different brands of high performance end mills. Let's take a look at the volume mill dialog. We have the technology expert at the top, and we'll come back to that in a minute. Below that is the active chip control sub dialog where we can prioritize speeds, feeds, cut width, or chip thickness. In most, not all, but in most cases, I prefer to prioritize chip thickness. Then we have the feeds and speed settings, which I'll completely ignore for now. The choice of side milling only, or if we turn that off, we can define the slotting depth and feed rate, the feed rate for slotting. And in volume mill slotting is when the tool is cutting more than 
uh, the step over that you defined. This part is an open pocket, so I'll leave this on side milling only. I actually prefer this strategy most of the time. We have some normal stock settings. These are used when cutting geometry normally. Um, a minimum toolpath radius for the trochoidal motion, which affects how tight of a corner the tool can reach, and repositioning settings for the moves between the end of one cutting stroke and the beginning of the next in the trochoidal motion. By the way, Volume Mill does an excellent job of deciding whether to keep the tool down and reposition by coming off the floor with a short helical move, reposition with a high feed move, and then helix back into the next cut, or on long moves, retract to the clearance and reposition. This high feed rate setting is the feed rate for the high feed repositioning move I just mentioned, and usually should be close to the fastest uh, feed rate your machine can interpolate at. Moving over to the right hand side of the dialog, we mostly have normal settings similar to other Gibbs Cam process types. So let's take a quick look at the solids tab. Here we have normal toolpath tolerance and surface stock settings, and in the lower right we have a checkbox and some settings for wall cleanup. Wall cleanup is what produces the definition to our 3D shapes. With a check mark for wall cleanup, the value in the desired step field will control the step ups that I mentioned earlier. This is what gives us such good definition to our 3D shapes. Let's take a quick look at how this works. Let me switch over to this part for a moment just to show you how the tapered walls or how the uh, wall cleanup works. Uh, this is a simple part with tapered walls that will rough out. I want to get as close to finished shape as possible, so I selected volume mill. Uh, we have a half inch end mill and the cut is set up like this. We are assuming that this is 4140 and we'll get our cut settings including speeds and feeds from the volume mill technology expert. I'll look at this in detail in just a minute. The things I want to point out for this cut, our Z-step is one inch, twice the diameter of the cutter. And notice that we're cutting dry. On the solids tab, we have cutting tolerance and surface stock, and we have our wall cleanup settings. I'll turn those off for a minute and redo the tool path. So you can see that without wall cleanup turned on, we basically have a pocket that is the shape of this cavity at one inch deep. It created tool path one inch deep where it could and nothing else. Let's go back into the process and turn wall cleanup back on. And the step up here is set to 30 thousandths. I'll hit redo and close the process. Let that calculate. All right, now I'll grab a section view and see if I can catch this toolpath near the bottom of the wall cleanup. Let's go to a front view and let this go slowly. So as the tool encounters a 3D face as it works its way out, it'll start making passes as high as necessary to cut within our surface stock setting for those surfaces. You can see that the effect of this is that each of these increasingly shallow cuts uses the maximum possible amount of the flute up to the maximum Z-step we defined. This is what provides the close definition on the 3D faces and generally allows us to go from our volume mill roughing cut or cuts to finishing with little or no intermediate cuts. All right, let me get back on task, back to the real part. And we'll dive back into the volume mill dialog. And I'll go back to the volume mill tab. And now let's take a look at Technology Expert. Technology Expert is the feeds and speeds calculator for volume mill. We start off describing our part material. We're cutting 4140, which is a low alloy steel. So I selected alloy steel from the drop down. We can define the Brunel or the Rockwell B or C hardness of our part material. And here we enter the maximum RPM and feed rate. These are the machine's maximums. These two sliders allow us to sort of personalize the speeds and feeds. 
Workpiece holding is the way for me to differentiate between possibly holding the part hanging out of the vise uh, four inches or maybe holding with a couple of strap clamps versus holding the part rigidly in a vise or solid fixture. Notice that changing the setting affects the feed rate, but not the spindle speed. So it specifically affects the chip load and the cutting pressure. Cutting aggressiveness, on the other hand, is the way for me to specify how aggressive I want to be with this cut. To me, this has a lot to do with the quality and condition of the end mill I'm using. Changing this setting affects both the spindle speed and the feed rate. I usually recommend that users start off with premium end mills designed for this type of tool path. Many gravitate to end mills from Helical Solutions since they are what volume mill is tested with. And that's where these numbers come from. Um, I happen to have Helical Solutions end mills when I made this test run, but I've also had similar success with end mills from a lot of companies, Walter, OSC, Hanita, Kinemetal, and others. Uh, I recommend starting out until you get more comfortable with the sliders near the center or maybe just to the right of center. But I suspect most of you will end up with the sliders at least 75% or more. But start out a little conservative and work your way up. This stuff works when you use it right. We can use this to calculate speeds and feeds for more than just volume mill toolpaths. We can also calculate tool, uh, feeds and speeds for heavy roughing, light roughing, finishing, or slotting. And you can see the changes in recommended feeds and speeds based on the type of cut we're taking. And I can specify work holding and cutting aggressiveness slider settings for these toolpath choices as well. Do keep in mind that these are tested with premium high performance carbide end mills in new condition. In this center section, we have our tool description, most of which we can't really alter since it pulls its data from our tool description. On a side note, uh, notice that the number of flutes is set to five. Uh, I had intended to use the seven flute end mill for this, but I seem to be a little bit fat fingered on an iPhone and type five instead of seven when I ordered. Uh, if I had ordered correctly, uh, let me just change this to seven flute for a second. You can see I would have picked up well over 100 inches per minute on my feed rate uh what would that that would two and a half minutes yeah about two and a half minutes that would have knocked off the cycle time but uh, unfortunately i was fat fingered and had a five flute uh, let me see we can come back uh, i can define my tool holder and i can define whether i'm using a coated or uncoated tool as you can see, all of these settings affect the recommended feeds and speeds. The results sections over here on the right are the values the software calculates based on the settings and the values we entered in the tool page and on this page. We can check the ones we want to apply and select Apply Checked, or if we want to apply everything, select Apply All. Most of the time, I just hit Apply All. With these settings, we end up with a cycle time of 7 minutes, 20 seconds, but we still have areas the tool couldn't get into. If we look at these next few volume mill operations, this one is simply roughing the lower part of the profile, while the final two volume mill operations perform material-only cuts with progressively smaller end mills to get into the places the larger end mill couldn't get and we have a roughed part that is ready for finishing passes. All of this with a total roughing time of under 12 minutes. If I turn on the rest of the toolpath that I ran on the video part, we'll see that I was able to immediately go from roughing to finishing. The vertical walls, the floors, and the 3D surfaces and my estimated cycle time for roughing and finish milling this side of the part complete is 32 minutes 4 seconds. My actual run time at the machine was right at 33 minutes. So volume mill produced a roughed part that was ready for finishing very very quickly. On top of that the volume mill cuts are quiet, no chatter or squealing of course, only the consistent sound of the cuts you heard in the video. 
The spindle load was consistent and stayed under 20% throughout the volume mill operations. Really, it stayed under 20% throughout the whole program. I ran five parts total with just one half inch end mill for the bulk of the roughing and one each three eighths and quarter inch end mill for the material only roughing and used the same quarter inch for finishing the vertical walls and then a quarter inch ball mill for finishing the 3D features. And if I laid each of these tools out on a table with some brand new end mills, it would be hard to tell which ones were used, even which half inch end mill had removed over 163 cubic inches of 4140 on these five parts. Let me show you what it looked like. This is the half inch end mill that I used for roughing the bulk of the material from the five blocks I ran last week. And it looks and feels like a brand new one. Shops that have started using volume mill for their heavy material removal commonly report significant, sometimes startling, tool life improvements as well as very profitable reductions in cycle time. Volume mill could be a game changer for your shop. If you haven't tried it yet, I encourage you to give it a whirl. Contact your Gibbscam reseller if you have questions about it. All of the high speed milling strategies I've shown you have their advantages and they have situations where they're definitely the right choice for the job. Overall, I believe volume mill is the one you'll find has the broadest application and the highest return on investment. All right, enough milling. Let's change gears and look at some turning. First, we'll take a look at volume turn. Uh, let me swap out a couple of parts since apparently I don't have the turning parts ready to go. I'll close the milling parts and just drag over the turning parts. I guess this is a case of the first casualty of action is the plan. Voluturn was developed to meet the demands of the power generation industry, which manufactures a lot of components that have very complex shapes and are usually made from stainless or let's just say challenging to machine high temperature alloys. However, like many of the technologies that were designed for a specific industry or a specific application, uh, think of some of the specialized technologies developed for the space program that found widespread commercial application, Voluturn has a much wider appeal than just the power generation industry. Much of what we discussed about volume mill also applies to Voluturn. They both use science-based strategies to control tool or insert engagement, eliminate dwells, and create fully tangential motion, eliminating abrupt directional changes. Every motion is a smooth, tangent, circular move. As with volume mill, this motion eliminates load spikes and allows for higher surface speeds and much higher feeds. This motion also distributes wear much more evenly than traditional tool paths, and that provides drastic tool life improvement, give, giving you predictability and consistency of tool life, and it also helps prevent notch formation on the inserts. Voluturn is a roughing strategy that's excellent for general roughing and is particularly well suited to grooving, especially deep or complex grooves. And I found that when combined with Gibbscam's advanced approach and retract capability, it gives you the ability to easily and safely get into and out of difficult areas, even undercut grooves while machining them with controlled engagement and motion. You'll see an increase in surface speeds, but you'll really see a significant increase in feed rates, regardless of the materials that you're turning. Volume turn is really at its best when roughing more complex shapes. As with volume mill, volume turn has a dedicated process dialog. I'll create a volume turn process with this button insert and we'll take a look at the dialog. By the way, you'll only see the volume turn option if the tool that you've selected is a round button insert. This is really a pretty normal Gibbscam turning process dialog for the most part. A couple of things to note here. We have a checkbox for active chip thickness control. 
With a round insert, even with the same step over and feed rate, the chip thickness will increase going into a radius, for example. If we turn this on, the feed rate will be automatically adjusted to maintain the defined chip thickness when it would otherwise vary due to the shape of the insert is turning. Another setting to be aware of is the minimum toolpath radius. Again, as with volume mill, the toolpath will be a racetrack style toolpath whenever possible and a modified tracoidal toolpath whenever needed. And this value defines the minimum radius that can be used in the tracoidal motion. A larger number, up to 90% of the radius of the tool, is often ideal since it can be more efficient and it provides better chip evacuation, although that's really more of an issue on the mill, while a smaller number allows the tool to get into tighter corners. This value should never be more than 90% or less than 10% of the tool radius. And in fact, volume turn will automatically correct any settings outside of those limits. The second high-speed toolpath for turning that we'll discuss is prime turning from Sandvik Coromant. Prime turning delivers cycle time reductions in excess of 50% and often more than five times the insert life compared to traditional strategies. Prime turning utilizes two insert shapes, prime type A and prime type B both of which have a unique shape that allows them to either face or turn with the same insert. Either of these inserts will present a low lead angle relative to the face being machined, creating several advantages that we'll take a look at in just a minute. First, let's take a look at the inserts. This is a prime turning type A insert, which is designed for finishing and facing. It isn't designed for heavy roughing, so they can squeeze in three cutting edges. And of course, they are available with different coatings, chip breakers, and other details specific to whatever material class you're cutting. This one is a prime turning type B insert, which is designed for roughing, but is also great for finishing and facing. This is a significantly beefier insert to better handle the stresses and heat of heavy roughing. And of course, it's available with different coatings, different chip breaker styles, and different relief strategies, all designed for the material you're cutting. Note that the edge of the insert has a, the tip radius leading into a very shallow angle and then transitions into a somewhat increased angle. And we're going to, we're going to talk about the importance of this in just a moment. Let's look at a roughing cut with a type B insert. You can see that the angle of the cutting edge compared to the surface being cut is really very small. That makes the contact area significant, spreading the heat and the force of the cut over a larger area. The edge closest to the tip radius has an extremely shallow angle relative to our z-axis. This provides maximum chip thinning in the final couple of revolutions of contact. This produces a superior surface finish despite the high feed rate, and ahead of that slight angle there is an area with more angle. This area prevents the insert from having too much surface area engaged and allows for much deeper cuts than we could make if the angle remained as tight as that trailing edge. Alright, why are we cutting away from the chuck? If I open this up and I reverse this tool path and regenerate it, making the cut move towards the chuck, you can see that the contact area is much smaller, which concentrates the heat and the pressure to this little area here. We wouldn't be able to run the feeds and speeds and depth of cut we were running and expect the insert to last. But if I go back to cutting away from the chuck, the heat and the pressure is spread out over a much larger portion of the insert. And the chip thinning effect when cutting away from the chuck with this insert allows us to feed much faster than a traditional strategy. And the geometry of the insert still produces a superior finish compared to the high feed rate. By the way, chip thinning refers to situations either in milling or turning 
where the thickness of the chip is less than the feed per revolution on the lathe or the feed per tooth on a mill. On a lathe, the chip thickness would be measured perpendicular to the cutting edge. So if the cutting edge is not perpendicular to the angle of motion, the thickness of the chip is reduced. If you have a tool with a significant lead angle, the chip thickness is much less than the feed per revolution. Prime turning type B inserts are designed to cut with a variable lead angle that allows extreme chip thinning at the trailing edge of the cut. In some cases with prime turning, the shallow relative lead angle may cause the depth of cut to be a little bit shallower than a traditional cut might be, but the increased feed rate more than makes up for it. So let's look at some numbers. This graphic shows recommended settings in M category materials, which are stainless steels. And we're looking at the recommendations for heavy roughing. If we look at the conventional cut, this recommends a surface speed of 656 surface foot with suitable inserts, of course. By the way, due to the shops I've worked in, probably well over 90% of the work I've done has been in Imperial, which is shown in the parentheses. For those of you who work in metric, those numbers are before the parentheses. So let's see, 656 surface feet with a feed rate of 10 thousandths per rev and a cut depth of 150 thousandths, which is 300 off the diameter per stroke. The prime tool path for the same material recommends 820 surface feet, an increase of uh, 20% over the traditional, 25% over the traditional. The feed rate for prime is 40 thousandths per rev and the cut depth is 120 thousandths. So we lost about 20% on the depth of cut, but we increased the feed per rev by 400% and we're spinning the spindle 25% faster. That comes out to a 321% improvement in material removal rates, and that doesn't even factor in the 80% improvement in tool life. Looking at recommended settings for steel, stainless steel, and super alloys, the material removal rate improvement over normal tool path and inserts for roughing, finishing, and facing ranges from about 120% to 450%. The tougher the material is to machine, the greater the improvement is. With either insert, type A or type B, Gibbscam produces tool paths designed specifically for these inserts, with arc end moves for every cut to prevent overloading on the initial move to depth. If we look at the process dialog, it will look pretty familiar to anyone who has used Gibbscam. We have a choice of roughing tool paths or finishing tool paths, standard turning settings, a cut depth, and it shows us the minimum and maximum for this insert. We can specify lead out parameters, normal speed and feed settings. I try to keep my tool settings up to date so that I can set these with a couple of clicks using the settings that I've, that I've settled on. Uh, I start with the manufacturer's recommended speeds and feeds, uh, noting the depth of cut where appropriate, and then tweak them if necessary uh, once I have my own proven numbers. These feeds and speeds can easily be saved to the tool, which is the way that I'm using them here, but they can also be captured in a saved process, which saves the tool and all the process settings and can be called up with two mouse clicks and applied to any appropriate part. This can allow you to not only program parts faster, but it also helps standardize your proven techniques and settings. Well, as usual, I've let the time get away from me a little. Um, I'll let you watch some video while I wrap things up. Today, we have looked at high-speed machining strategies, mostly for roughing, for milling, and for turning. On the milling side, we looked at plunge roughing, which can be great for deep features on relatively prismatic parts that don't have a lot of small details. We looked at high feed milling, which can be a great choice in a number of situations, but is particularly well suited to parts where you can take advantage of the rigidity of the tool to reach deep recesses to machine larger areas or parts with very deep slot type features. 
And we looked at volume mill, which allows for very fast material removal and excels at machining complex parts with a great amount of detail. Volume mill slashes roughing time, improves tool life and predictability, and reduces wear and tear on your machines. Then on the turning side, we looked at volume turn, which gives us many of the advantages of volume mill, but for turning. It is the tool for roughing deep or complex grooves, especially in difficult to machine materials such as stainless, nickel alloys, or other super alloys. Then we looked at Sandvik Coromant's Prime Turning. This is an absolute beast for heavy roughing on a lathe, regardless of the material. It provides both inserts as well as specialized tool paths for roughing, finishing, and facing. We also discussed how Gibbscam's knowledge of material remaining, in other words, the software's understanding of exactly what material is still there after all the previous machining has occurred, and can eliminate air cutting on material only operations, and provides another facet supporting high speed machining. If you're interested in investigating how Gibbscam's high speed machining strategies can benefit your shop, either by increasing throughput, reducing production and tooling cost, reducing wear and tear on your machines, streamlining and simplifying the programming process, or all of the above, or learning more about Gibbscam in general, contact your Gibbscam reseller for more information or a personal demonstration. Again, links to the recording of this webinar will go out via email tomorrow, if, just in case you'd like to review it or share it with a friend, coworker, or colleague. We know that your schedules are very demanding. Thank you for taking the time to join us for this webinar.